Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to the closing session of our annual meeting and also the beginning of our next year of work. I hope as you're watching us on YouTube that you'll share in the chat some of what you're taking away from the meeting and what you're looking forward to in the 2022. In fact, I see that people, friends are already sharing a great deal. I see the joy in your comments. I wish I could see your faces in this final session, but it is just such a joy to see all of your comments. And as we begin this final session, we wanted to continue to reflect the community that has participated with us with one more video from friends around the country and from some of our staff that were excited to join our gathering today. Hey everyone, my name is Alicia and I'm FCNL's Director of Quaker Leadership coming to you from Tacoma Park, Maryland and my patio garden. Thank you so much for being part of this 2021 annual meeting and Quaker Public Policy Institute and for working with this community towards the world we seek. Hi, I'm Diana Olbaum. I'm out here at my morning walk to the White House and I am the Legislative Director for Foreign Policy at FCNL. Thank you so much for being here with us to lobby and to join together at annual meeting. We really appreciate all your support. Hi folks, this is Meg Kinghorn and Casey Wilson from the West Virginia Advocacy Team. And we're greeting you from the top of Spruce Knob, the highest point in the state. Hi everyone, my name is Stephen Donahoe and I'm standing in front of Friends Place on Capitol Hill. I am FCNL's Director of Development and I want to thank you so much for joining us for our 2021 Quaker Public Policy Institute and Annual Meeting. Take care. Bye. Hello friends, greetings from Orcas Island, Washington. My name's Tom Rossum and I'm a member of Lopez Island Friends Meeting and a proud member of the FCNL San Juan Islands Advocacy Team. Go team! What a great ending. And it is just so fabulous to have seen all of you over these days at our annual meeting in Quaker Public Policy Institute. And for me, at least, the last thing I just wanted to share with you is at the beginning of this session, we set a goal of reaching 25 new sustainers at this annual meeting. The good news is we're almost halfway there to that, to that goal. The financial support is really a key foundation of our strength as a community. Your contributions support our lobbying in Washington, the lobbying around the country, and keep us strong and focused during this transition period. If you haven't already signed up, there is still time. You can go to fcnl.org slash sustainers. Signing up to have a monthly sum charged to your credit card is really the easiest way to support FCNL, and it provides us with a regular source of revenue. I also want to thank all of the sustainers we have in this meeting now, and I have requests for you as well. I hope that those of you who are sustainers might be able to think about one person who is not here today who you would like to share the joy of this meeting with. And you could simply send them an email about your participation in annual meeting and the lobby day and let them know that you are a sustainer and then invite them to become a sustainer in writing with a link to fcnl.org slash sustainers. That would really help us both meet this goal and continue this work. So now I'd like to hand it over to Ron Ferguson. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for that great set of videos too. That's wonderful to see. I completely concur with what has already been said that this is a moment of joy in the life of this organization and of these meetings. We have accomplished a lot together this weekend, and it has been truly remarkable to watch happen. Simply would want to comment, however, that this is also a bittersweet moment in some ways. One of those is that this is the fourth and final FCNL annual meeting, which will be um, 
planned and organized by Annie Chirazi, our event planner at FCNL. She has been superb for all four of those years, two of them totally virtual last year and this year. And we just need Annie to know how much we appreciate the work that she has done, how superb it has been, how grateful we are, and we wish her well in her new um, employment out on the West Coast. Thank you, Annie, for your incredible efforts on our behalf. It's also a bittersweet moment because after 10 years of dedicated service, this is Diane Randall's last annual meeting as general secretary. And once again, she's not going away and we're not letting her get away, but we are grateful, so grateful for the work that she has done over these 10 years and grateful that she was able to be with us so fully for this annual meeting this year. We are all preparing to head for home. Most of you are already there. Some of us have a little distance to travel, but we go away from these meetings with hearts filled with thankfulness. As we have reviewed the work that has been done in this past year, how can it do anything producing you thankfulness that friends have found a way in these difficult circumstances to still accomplish the amount of work, the kind of work, the superb quality of work that has been done. Most of that work, if you think about it, over the agenda of these annual meetings has actually been work that is in preparation for what's gonna happen next year. We've reviewed the events of the past year, but the preparation and real investment of energy and resource and time has been in getting ready for 2022 and beyond. If that is not an expression of choosing hope, I don't know what is. If we had no hope, we would have forgotten about next year and beyond, but we choose hope. And we have spent this time and this energy and these resources to get ready for even bigger and better things in the coming year. We are preparing for new leadership. It has just been approved. She's looking at us now through her YouTube connection. We'll be hearing from Bridget in just a moment. We are also um, moving forward into the new year with new committees in place, approved by the general committee, ready to go to work. We are moving into the new year with new budgets in place, new plans for raising the money that is needed to do the work that is so necessary in this moment in our country's history. All of that is work that is expressive of hope that we will gather in 2022 and we will work for justice because we've prepared to do it and we've planned and now we're ready to go. So we have been faithful to the theme that the Annual Meeting Planning Committee has set for these meetings. To live in hope and work for justice all the time. We are so grateful that you have participated in that. As we prepare to launch into this new year, there's still three um, new program assistants, young fellows, I'm not even sure what the proper title is anymore, who we've not heard from, and we are going to hear from them now. So please, if we may, let's hear from these program assistants. Hello all, my name is Rosalie Reitz, and I am this year's program assistant for the Sustainable Energy and Environment Portfolio. When it comes to my personal media consumption, I work to be very purposeful about what I'm exposing myself to. I avoid books and shows that romanticize unethical behavior, or promote values that I don't align with. But I still tend to have a pessimistic view of current events and our current realities. And if you felt that way too, you know how draining it can be. There are plenty of methods people use to break out of the negative narratives they may assume about our world. Journaling, volunteering, traveling, creating, and a lot more. And those are all so wonderful. But what works for me is science fiction. I found that Science fiction brings so much more to the table than simply asking, oh, what would happen if we had robots? It asks, what if our culture placed higher emphasis on different values? And what if our society made different choices? Science fiction asks the reader to believe in transcendence, to believe that not only can our world be vastly different from the way it is now, 
but that we can be so much better than we are now. No matter my pessimistic tendencies, I'm drawn towards this type of hopeful narrative that exists in sci-fi, and that is perhaps what brought me to FCNL. At FCNL, we approach our work with active hope, the faith that things will get better, no matter how bad it looks right now. What drew me to working with FCNL on environmental issues is true faith that we can transcend beyond our current circumstances to create a reality that is better for our posterity. The novel Dune by Frank Herbert deals with a population living on a desert-like planet where water is the scarcest resource of all. This population lives in an unbearably harsh environment with little hope of a better life in their immediate future. These kinds of circumstances can easily lead to frustration, despair, anger, and violence. Yet this population unified under the hope that someday they could terraform their planet to the point of having bodies of water or even rain. It would be a generations long process, but everyone on the planet works together toward that end to slowly but surely create the technology and the circumstances to make their dream a reality someday. In other words, they are being responsible stewards of their land to benefit not themselves, but their progeny. Frank Herbert writes this population to be so committed to this environmental goal that it becomes a core tenet of their religion and moral code. This aspect of Dune really resonated with me because stewardship is also a core tenet of my faith and values. Growing up, I was taught that if I have the knowledge of how my choices affect the world around me, it's my responsibility to make the morally correct decisions to benefit not just my current society, but also those that will come after me. So I'm feeling very blessed that I have the opportunity to advocate for exactly that with FCNL this year in a community of like-minded friends. Another meaningful science fiction work is the popular TV series, Star Trek, The Next Generation. This tale follows the crew of the starship, the USS Enterprise, as they explore the frontier of the universe. The crew all come from an interplanetary organization called the Federation that consists of many civilizations and societies all working together to share technology, resources, and culture. Wow, being able to get over the divisiveness that affects our world today and transcend to a greater community that spans beyond our planet, that's so much greater than the global community we aspire to today. And all because Federation citizens are committed to overcoming prejudices and upholding the natural rights of all peoples. That sounds a lot like the world we seek. So it's no wonder that I've watched hundreds of hours of Star Trek, although I am not necessarily proud to admit to that much time in front of the TV. It's unbelievably refreshing to consider a world unified beyond borders with a commitment to community that is deeply ingrained in their culture. And I'm so glad that I found an organization that is built on these same values of peace and community that are so important to me. Note that none of the science fiction examples I used are perfect. None of them portray a perfect world or even one free of violence. But there are always truths we can learn from the stories they tell. We are all capable of sacrificing some comfort for the good of future generations, a good that we today may never live to see. We are capable of listening to our friends and taking action to create a world of peace and dignity excuse me, dignity for ourselves and our neighbors. We know this. And I'm telling you that we have more than the capability. We have the will. And our imperfect world will unify someday under values of stewardship, peace, and community. Even if it doesn't happen in this lifetime, know that the next generation will be following your example to make it happen. Hello everyone, hola a todos, my name is Diana Maldonado. I am the Immigration and Refugee Program Assistant at FCNL, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about my journey and life experiences, which led me today to be able to share this space with you all. I am a daughter, I am a sister, I am a friend, a student, I am a proud Latina woman, I am undocumented, and I am a person of faith. When I arrived to the United States as a child with my family, 
I was very confused and did not understand what made me so different from other kids my age. Was it the way I looked? Was it the way I spoke? How can you explain this to a child? I asked many questions and most of them, I still have a difficult time understanding today. I will always remember the same answer I received from my parents every time. Mija, creemos en ustedes, nosotros solamente deseamos que tú y tu hermano tengan un mejor futuro, lleno de éxito, felicidad y seguridad. Sacrificaríamos todo una y otra vez por ustedes. Daughter, we believe in you too. We just deeply desire both you and your brother have a better future, full of happiness, success, and safety. We would do it all over again for you too. I knew my life would not be easy as I began my new journey being undocumented but I sure knew I was gonna make my parents proud and give back by representing my community and protecting my undocumented communities. Growing up, I couldn't help but fear being separated from my family and the only place I get to call home. I then realized education was my shield and pathway to best protect myself and my family. My experiences as an undocumented woman and first generation college graduate in the family has shaped my life today the life I learned to choose for myself and not the life determined for me. There were many opportunities that were taken away because of my status and how I decided to, decided to seek them instead, being a documented Latina and a first generation college student in my family, which has nurtured me in the role of resilience to engage and fight for human rights, racial justice and for humanity overall. Growing up like any passionate student, I always seek to attend a university out of state and live the ultimate college experience with my friends. I did not have that option, even though I had just worked just as hard for it. And I was not gonna let that opportunity be taken away from me. I proudly attended my local college and university 10 minutes away from home. Yes, 10 minutes. And my parents would still have to put up with me. I also knew that in order to afford college, I would have to work at least a full-time job plus get good grades in order to qualify for the lottery scholarship, which only covered less than 10% of my tuition. And I still had to be a full-time student. For about three years, I was a full-time student and a full-time employee. For my senior year in college, I got a second job, which was part of my passion as an advocate for immigration. And I could not let that opportunity go away. Well, let me tell you, I did not get any sleep, but I just knew I was on the right path and all the stressful emotional nights could be dealt with by my favorite snacks. I always found comfort knowing all the sacrifices would be worth it when I would give back to my family for all their sacrifices and just being able to legally represent all the vulnerable communities as an immigration lawyer and overall as a human rights advocate. Throughout my whole college career, I was an honor student and I got no sleep. Well, let me tell you, I got a degree and I was debt free, meaning zero balances and no student loans. I felt very fulfilled, but I knew this was not the end of my education journey. Now all over again for grad school. Once again, my faith kept me going. I know my bumpy journey had a purpose and I know that my work as an immigration and human rights advocate will continue leading me to the right path. Once again, I feel safe, confident, and strong when I hold on to my faith. I am a human just like everyone else, and I deserve the same opportunities to flourish regardless of where, the, where I'm born or what I contribute to a country. In high school, I was involved in many community service programs and clubs that prepared my work with organizing and advocacy. I traveled around the US to advocate for immigration issues, which led me to a New Mexico Dream Team chapter at my local college and for United We Dream. I educated students and the community on immigration issues and grassroots work. I was then introduced to FCNL when I was invited to attend FCNL's Spring Lobby Weekend at DC in 2019 to lobby and advocate for immigration legislation. I loved the experience and wanted to get further involved with FCNL's organization. So I became a 2020 and 2021 Advocacy Corp, which is an 11-month program focused on grassroots organizing for the state I represent. I then got the program assistant position, which I'm currently in. This is a 10-month young fellowship focused on educating FCNL's network, addressing immigration issues by developing legislative strategies and gaining expertise of the system on a federal level. 
and working with coalitions. All of these align with striving for a just, inclusive, and humane United States immigration system, while advocating for policy with a faith-based approach. I stand close to my faith, knowing that I can achieve anything with God by my side, which has helped me find my way with FCNL. I can reflect from the same values we both hold, simply because these values have made me stronger as an individual and for the work I do, which is keeping my faith in a world that may seem so unfair and cruel. Once again, I feel safe, confident, and stronger when I hold on to my faith, because with my faith, there is hope. And with hope, I can achieve anything I put my heart and mind to. It has been a privilege to represent my undocumented people while working with a passionate team at FCNL. The major impact and support FCNL has in my life and my professional development from all the experiences, starting as a constituent student attending lobby visits during spring lobby weekend as, and as an advocacy corps, and now currently as a program assistant, transforming and working towards a just, inclusive, and humane United States immigration system. This is where I know I have, find, I have found my purpose, and I know that I'm closer than ever to achieving the American dream I have always desired. Hello friends, my name is Destiny Bates and I am the program assistant for Young Adult Outreach here at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. I once read that chronically dissatisfied people simply believe that others are responsible for their happiness which I find incredibly offensive because as a member of the chronically dissatisfied club, I think that assumption is a lazy one. Those who exist with my affliction simply have a deep yearning for something more and understanding that there is no freedom in the status quo. And for most of my adolescent life, I was never content. I spent significant time wishing myself out of the present moment. When I was 10, I wanted to be 13. When I was 13, I couldn't wait until my sweet 16. And by 16, I was praying for adulthood to take me anywhere that wasn't under the Mason-Dixon line. In a sense, I couldn't wait for my life to be over. I, like so many of my peers, was following the same success sequence most of our parents encourage us to do. You know the one, go to school, get a job, fall in love, get married, possibly have children and tell them to do the same exact thing. But times are changing. The kids are not all right. Gen Z is said to be one of the best educated, diverse groups yet, but we along with millennials are the most disillusioned. And it's because we've been lied to. Whether you wanna blame facing terrible economic odds, social unrest, a polarized political system, or the fact that the climate disaster is here, there's a lot to fuel my existential dread. So where did I have to go from here? I was a liberal arts graduate looking for a job in the middle of a global pandemic. Perfect. To LinkedIn I go. Quickly, I stumbled upon FCNL. I was intrigued. I read about the world that FCNL seeks. A world free of war and the threat of war? A society with equity and justice for all? a community where every person's potential may be fulfilled and an earth restored. And I thought, wow, the Quakers are really optimistic. So I applied in hopes that maybe this was the something more I had been yearning for, the opportunity to be an integral part of an organization advocating for policy that affirms the inherent dignity and worth of all people. This was something that I could stay present for. My role here at FCNL allows me to connect with students and young advocates all over the country who so desperately want to believe that our country can live up to its principles. Most recently, I got to attend a retreat with our advocacy corps organizers who are working for environmental justice this year. What struck me about this group is that though they are working for an organization that is more reformist, their ideas are revolutionary. FCNL understands that incremental change is a necessary and often frustrating process towards a better world. But what I have come to realize is this organization is simultaneously building up the next generation of activists who will liberate us from these unjust structures. And they will do so with the tools and the network FCNL gave them. And it's because of my time here that I can confidently say to my peers, everything is going to be all right.
My apologies, those buttons have gotten me again. So thank you to Rosalie and Diana and Destiny for sharing these stories with us and for the promise of work that will be done in this coming year. We look forward to watching you at work for FCNL. We hope that all of you can sense the importance of this program to FCNL's operations and can sense the impact that the Young Adult Network will have in partnership with all the rest of us. We are so grateful for these remarkable young people who have come to do this work together with us. So we give you thanks, gratitude for what you are doing. As we look ahead to the new year, in just the last session, we have decided that we will indeed have a new General Secretary, Bridget Moiks. She is with us now, and we will turn to her for some comments for as much as she wants to share with us. Bridget? Thank you so much, Ron. It's so nice to be back with you all. It's been a momentous Sunday in the Moiks household here. We've been um, practicing our two religious traditions. Uh, Quakerism, of course, it was so wonderful to join you all for worship. And the message from Deborah was so wonderful, the both and vision. And the second religious tradition in our household, which is soccer. <laughs> so both my boys have been in full day tournaments. One of them won the whole tournament. The other one is right now neck and neck, one to one tied score in the final game. So a lot of things have been hanging in the balance and I am just so, um, joyful, full of gratitude and hope, uh, was so excited to begin to receive text messages from the search committee and friends just before I zoomed into this call with the news of the approval. Thank you, friends. I am so, so deeply honored. And I'm excited. Um, throughout this whole discernment process, that is the word that has been coming up again and again for me and um, for others when I talk to them. And it didn't start that way, actually. So when Diane called me and told me she was retiring and to be prepared, there might be some people calling me. I said, well, that's nice. They can call and I'll give them some good ideas of people who might want this job because, wow, I couldn't imagine uh, who could fill those shoes. And uh, Diane, I just wanna say a huge thank you to you for the incredible service, the faith that you have brought to FCNL, the remarkable strategic organizational mind and um, growth focus that you have given as a legacy to this organization and to the support that you've given me. Um, just as a friend, as your staff person, when you first came on, um, when I was clerking, the the relationship has been remarkable for me and i've learned so much from you and i just want to say thank you you will be so so missed although as ron says you will not be gone um fcnl has a way of keeping people in um the community in the family and i realized it was 25 years ago um that i gave my first speech at annual meeting as a legislative intern, I was listening to those speeches and they're, um, it's just so impressive. I was not nearly, nearly that impressive, I'm quite sure. Um, but at that time, I had never lobbied. Um, I was not a Quaker at that time. I had never studied peace and conflict. I had never worked on foreign policy issues. I had never imagined the journey and the path that would take me to where we are today and to this role. And when I talk to people, I say, you know, you, your life unfolds and you might have a plan, but you really don't know where you're going a lot of the time. But then sometimes you look back and you realize, oh, it makes perfect sense. And that's because of course, we are not the ones in charge. Um, that's because way is opening, the spirit, God, the divine light, is opening the path before us without us even realizing it. The discernment process um, 
this past year has been has involved so many people. I could spend the next 20 minutes just thanking all the individuals who supported me and every single person on that search committee. Um, Joe Volk for uh, encouraging me to think about applying when I said, I can't imagine that this could fit my life um, and be able to, and that I could be able to do this. It's a very humbling process. And at the same time, I never felt anything but deeply held and supported through all of it. So I want to thank every single person um, on this call and so many others out there. And I want to thank you all for, for playing that part in the way opening and inviting me into leadership again and again into this remarkable, relentless, hopeful work that we do together. Um, what an amazing gift. What an amazing gift. At one point, Joe said, well, you know, if they confirm, whoever they confirm as the general secretary, FCNO will make history at this annual meeting, confirming a general secretary virtually. Congratulations, you've never done that before, friends. Good job. Amazing. It is amazing what we have come to learn over these past few years. And gosh, Annie, wow, are we going to miss you. And thank you for helping us um, do this work together in these new ways. But I think also you all, we all are making history because we're doing this every year again and again. That is how history is made. It is the keep on keeping on that Ed Snyder encouraged us to do year after year. The relentless, hopeful work that friends do and that FCNL is known for. The other word that kept coming up um, through this process for me was home. And it was just mentioned earlier. I've always spoken of FCNL as my spiritual and professional home. And people would say, how are you feeling? I said, I, I feel like I'm coming home. And so the house is a lot bigger, friends. The family is growing and changing in beautiful ways. Wow. But it does feel like home. And it's so wonderful to be with you all. And it is a leap of faith for all of us. Every time we take, make an act of faith, every time we do a lobby visit, every time we write a letter, every time we reach out to a neighbor or a friend or a family and invite them into this work with us, it's a leap of faith. So I am just so grateful that you have invited me into this leap of faith to do again and again with you and so excited for our wings to keep growing and stretching together. Thank you so much, friends. I can't wait to work with you. And in the meantime, I wanna remind us of Sarah Bessie's words. Keep praying, keep standing, keep working. Cultivate your joy and rest and renewal as an act of resistance. We're gonna keep choosing hope together and we're going to keep working for justice, friends. I can't wait to do it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget, for these beautiful words. Thank you for minding that light that has led you home. We're very thankful that you did that. Thank you for choosing hope with us and choosing to come and work with us for justice in the years that are ahead. We look forward to that with hearts filled with gratitude. I also want to express thanks to Diane Randall um, on this occasion as we close this meeting for 10 years of superb leadership in doing this work together. I, last evening listening to Diane, jotted something down on my notes um, and just have not had a chance to share this with Diane personally, but I wanted to say this before the whole group. I remember in one of those early days, early annual meetings when she had just first come on, that she gave a message in which she challenged the general committee of FCNL and said that she would lead the staff in working three Ps, persistence, prophetic 
and powerful. I'll bet most of you remember her saying those things. I don't know why, but those are stuck in my brain from long ago. I want to give Diane a new letter, an alliteration of D's instead of P's. But I, the thing that I jotted down last evening was that reflecting on these past 10 years, Diane has served this organization with great decency, with great dignity, with great determination, and with great dedication. And she should rest easy knowing that we all recognize that and are so thankful for the leadership that she has provided. We also want to thank the General Committee for your persistence in hanging with us through these difficult years of pandemic, having to do things in new ways and trying to figure it all out. We're very grateful that you have stuck with us, that you have supported us so profoundly and so well. We want to encourage you to remain engaged in the work of FCNL and its advocacy work on the Capitol Hill. We want to ask that you remain engaged in supporting FCNL financially as you are able to do so and as you are led to do so. We ask that you continue to support FCNL primarily with your spiritual discernment, listening to the guidance of God's spirit as we move into a new, dec a new decade of uncertain circumstances, but of probably endless opportunities to work together. One friend has sent in a message today asking that we be sure and remind all general committee members that as you return to your local meeting after having been part of this annual meeting, that you take these good newses of hope back to your local meeting. Tell them what happened. Tell them what you learned here. Tell them what you participated in here. Tell them what you have learned by being a part of this and encourage them to join us in these days of new hope and new justice, working together for justice. I also want to thank the General Committee for the privilege of having been your clerk for two years virtually, a virtual clerk. <laughs> it has been a learning experience for me. In fact, part of the password for my getting into Director Point to try to keep up with everything Two years ago, I wrote it in there. It's right in within the password, steep learning curve, because I knew it was going to be one. And it has been, but it has been a rewarding experience. And I just treasure these times of being together with you and the opportunity to do this work together with all of you. You have been patient and gracious to me. We've always opened these Zoom meetings asking for your grace and patience, because this is difficult to do in such a new way. You have shown that to me in abundance and I cannot thank you enough. With all of that, I believe we've come to the end of FCNL's annual meeting for 2021. And so at this moment, we will adjourn this annual meeting to meet again in November of 2022 in a place and in a manner that has not yet been finally determined, I don't think, but hopefully in person with one another next year, or at the call of your new clerk, Mary Lou Hatcher. God bless you all. Stay safe where you are. Be joyful. Choose hope. And join us to work together for justice. We are at liberty. Thank you, friends. <laughs>